So we begin with chanting uh, the Buddhist refuges and precepts. So uh, the word refuges, you know, the first time, I remember the first time I heard um, when I went to a Buddhist uh, gathering and I, I heard about the refuges and I thought, oh, I wonder what re- that's about. You know, what's a refuge? Why, why do I need a refuge? And so the refuges are um, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And and we talk about them as refuges because uh, it's, um, there's a lot of um, times in our lives when we may feel that we need a refuge, (laughs) that we feel a little bit lost and disoriented and and maybe alone, um, and uh, confused, not sure where to turn. And so the refuges are ways that we can um, bring into our our heart, into our mind. They're They're really inner refuges. We really find them, you know, we talk about them as the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And, you know, we think of the Buddha, and that's some, a historical person, and the Dharma, the teachings, and the Sangha, you know, the people. But more and more as we practice, we understand that the Buddha is that quality of being aware and awake and free within ourselves that uh, is available to us um, through the practice of mindfulness, through the practice of kindness and, 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 and wisdom. And, and, uh, and the Dharma is how those qualities develop within us, how, how that orientation, how that development of mind happens. Um, uh, it's a way of cultivating our own being to become more uh, wise and able to live life more fully and freely. And, um, and then the sangha is the community of those who gather, and and we do need that community. We do need that sense of belonging, uh, and we do need the encouragement. And it's a mutuality. We also need to feel that we're part of um, uh, something larger than ourselves. That uh, as we as we walk the path, um, so. So these refuges are really important. And, uh, and then the precepts are, um, it's, it's ways that we cultivate an intention to, to not bring harm, to not cause harm, uh, to, to live gently in this world, to live, uh, to live without creating suffering for ourselves and for others, because actually the precepts not only protect um, our kind of protection when we when we carry that intention to not cause harm in these particular ways, uh, they they protect ourselves as well from the suffering that that results from you know intentionally causing harm and even accidentally causing harm. Uh, we can we can uh, suffer. So so I'm going to. Um, Share the screen, uh, and and for those of you at home, you can open that. Um, and and these these are in the lang- the Pali language. So uh, if you like, you can either chant in the Pali with me, uh, and uh, or just listen. Or you can, um, and I'm, you know, if you're at home, I'm going to ask that you not turn on your mic because it gets pretty chaotic, <laughs> the sound. But, um, yeah, or you can read the English uh, translation if you just want to understand more about what we're saying. Oh, I forgot to take out my equipment.
Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Sangang Saranang Gachami Duty ampi budang saranang gachami. Duty ampi damang saranang gachami. Duty ampi sangang saranang gachami. Tati ampi budang saranang gachami. Tati ampi damang saranang gachami. Tati ampi sangang saranang gachami. Panati pata veramani. Sikapadam samadhyami Adinadana veramani Sikapadam samadhyami Kame sumichachara where are many seek up padam samadhyami? Musa wada where are many seek up padam samadhyami? Sura Maria Maja Pamadatana where are many seek up padam samadhyami? Idam misila maga fala nyanasa pachayo ho tu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Anumodami. So this is our uh, last um, session uh, for uh, this year uh, till uh, we're taking a summer break. And um, so we've been working over, since the fall, we've been kind of working our our way through one of the um, kind of main discourses in in this tradition of Buddhism. Uh, It's called the Four establishments or four foundations of mindfulness. And it's all about how we can cultivate uh, mindfulness, this quality of being, paying attention, being aware in our lives. Like right now, in this moment, you know, it's mindfulness is always something that's happening right now in the moment. And it has these qualities of 
like n- not judging our experience. Like, okay, you know, whatever's coming up in the body, whatever's coming up in the heart, in the mind, that's, it is what it is. It is what it is. Uh, and, um, and so paying attention and valuing what is happening in the moment. So mindfulness doesn't mean that we don't respond, but when we actually take in without reacting, saying, oh, I don't like this, I don't want this, this shouldn't be happening. You know, like how many times do we do that? This shouldn't be happening. Well, it is happening. And then how do I respond right now? Um, and so the mindfulness, you know, we've been, we've been exploring this over the course of the year, um, how to cultivate this quality. <clears throat> And, um, and over the past uh, months or six weeks or so, we've been looking at uh, what are called the awakening factors. Um, so these are, these are particular factors that really, as we you know, cultivate them, they're, it's not, they're, we have them. We have these qualities in our heart and mind, um, but we can bring them to more fullness. We can bring them to, uh, we, can, we can make them deeper and more uh, present in our, in our lives, in the way that we engage in the world. Um, so the one that we're talking about today is equanimity. It's, 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 uh, it's the seventh. Um, and... And equanimity really uh, is co- bringing to fullness some of those qualities that I was talking about. Like equanimity is actually within mindfulness. When we pay attention without reacting and wanting things to be different, that actually has a, the seed of equanimity in it. You know, it's not, it's not a word that we use very often, I think, either in, definitely not in English, and I don't think in French either. It's not like, you know, when you talk about equanimity, it's not, it's not a quality that, that we talk about very often. Um, and it's a bit of a puzzling one for many people because it's often talked about with a sense of not um, being kind of caught up in our preferences. So, um, you know, we all have preferences, you know, so, so, so it's a little puzzling, you know. What does it mean that I'm not supposed to have preferences or I'm not supposed to be um, kind of caught or tied to my preferences? So, you know, like if somebody asks you, do you want, you know, vanilla or pistachio or chocolate ice cream, you know, you can say whatever you prefer, right? It's so it, we all have those kind of preferences and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, you know, unless you say to yourself, well, I want to try something new. I always go with chocolate, so maybe I'll try pistachio. Uh, but, you know, and... And in bigger things in life than ice cream, too, we can, we can become aware of our preferences and, and say, oh, you know, maybe I want to try something a different way. But, but preferences in life, uh, you know, life unfolds in many ways that are not according to our preference, right? You know, we, we need to get up in the morning, uh, to do something and we may have slept badly. Um, maybe if we're a parent and we have a kid who's sick in, during the night and we have to get up and take care of them, you know, it's, it may not be something that our body, you know, or we want to do, but we do want to do it, you know, of course. Um, but we, can't, we may wish that we could just go back to sleep. 
Um, and we may have a coworker or somebody in some kind of group that we're in um, at school or, uh, or at work that we find really difficult to, to work with, to communicate with. So it's not our preference to work with that person or, but, you know, when we, we, so when we cultivate this quality of equanimity, it's not just rolling our eyes and putting up with the person and saying, oh, there they go again, okay. But it's like uh, it calming that reactivity and, and asking ourselves, you know, can I engage in this in a way that maybe is more open-hearted, uh, recognizing that this preference, it's not comfortable. So, um, so earlier on in our exploration of the discourse, we, we talked about you know, our feeling, feeling tones, you know, so some things are pleasant, some things are unpleasant, and, and some things, you know, are kind of neutral, not particularly pleasant or unpleasant. And we tend to want what's pleasant. We tend to be um, kind of drawn to do what's pleasant, and we tend to kind of want to avoid or push away or distract ourselves from what's unpleasant. Uh, and that is how we're caught up in our preferences. Um, you know, uh, and again, it's not that we should never um, follow our inclination to do something pleasant. That's, you know, of course. Um, but, um, but it's that you know, noticing how caught up we are, and especially, you know, when, when we're just always kind of hooked by wanting and wanting and wanting more and wanting different and wanting something new and, and, and kind of, it's a, it can become kind of addictive, whether it's food or new clothes or new experiences or, um, uh, you know, new gadgets, you know, new, new devices. Um, we can really get caught in that kind of wanting that, that little hit of, oh, this is interesting, this is fun, this is nice. And then, you know, it, and then the pleasant experience kind of gets a little bit old and, and then, okay, what's next? You know, so there's a kind of addictive quality to it. And then, Avoiding what's unpleasant, so you know whether it's a task or or a feeling like oh, I feel sad. Uh, you know, I I just notice I feel sad. I don't know really know why, and and all of a sudden I find myself getting up and going to the fridge, or or uh, you know um, playing a video game, or not me, but you know. I know a lot of people do that. And, uh, you know, not something that will kind of help me tune in and process what's going on in myself, but something that's just going to take me away and distract. And, and then, you know, that whatever it is, that, that sadness, it's going to be there. And it's going to drive me maybe uh, to could be to addictive behavior or to or to avoidance or to um, whatever it is it, it, I'm dis it's disconnecting me from my heart um, so so equanimity this this quality of having the capacity to be um, non reactively with whatever is experienced coming up in our lives, uh, not, not pushing away, not rejecting it, not judging it, not uh, 
distracting ourselves, um, not reaching out and grasping for more and more and more, but rather with receptivity, interest, openness, um, curiosity, looking into it, what's there, being present with it. So, uh, so for those of you who have been following these, these talks, um, you know, you might recognize some of these activities as earlier awakening factors. So mindfulness, uh, so mindfulness is, you know, paying attention uh, without rejecting or grasping. So those qualities are there. Investigation. Being curious, ah, what's going on? We talked about that, so it's a, it's a deepening, a development of that. Uh, energy, so we bring energy to it. Um, joy, so all of this, all of these bring joy when we're really in touch with what's going on in our lives, in the moment, within ourselves and around us. And uh, tranquility and collectedness of mind. So all of these are the previous awakening factors. So sometimes um, people can make the mistake of thinking that uh, equanimity is about not caring, you know, being indifferent. Oh, I don't care, you know. Like, uh, you know, so... So we were going to go for a picnic today, and, um, and it's pouring rain, you know. Oh, well, I don't care. I'm equo- equ- equanimous. So equanimity is, is not being detached from, you know, how we may feel about something. But it's connecting to the feeling accepting it and saying, you know, well, I guess that's the way it is today. (laughs) We're not going to have a picnic and maybe we can gather in another way, you know, and be content with that, except things are as they are. Um, So, so it's, it's, it's a kind of balance. Uh, This teacher that I've been talking about a lot in our, in our exploration Bhikkhu Analyo uses the word for equanimity uh, in this context. Um, the, the Pali word is upekka, and so he translates it as equipoise in this context. So equipoise is, means having a balance, so it's having a balance of mind. And then I, th- I like a word, for me, a word that evokes equanimity is perspective. It's like having a big view, you know, like, okay, we can't have a picnic, you know. It's not the end of the world, you know. Yeah, we have some nice food prepared. Let's, you know, uh, let's do something else. Uh, We can eat together and, uh, you know, play some games or do something else. Um, and, uh, and the picnic will be for another day. Equanimity arises. We cultivate equanimity. The way, so in Buddhist teachings, we, we learn that everything that happens comes from previous causes and conditions. So it's like, um, if, if uh, we see that there's somebody who's, who's patient, who's kind, who's generous, well, they, there's, there are causes and conditions that have given rise to those qualities. Um, you know, maybe they've experienced in their lives people who were patient with them, and they realized how lovely it is for somebody not to be, you know, on their case all the time uh, to get things done or whatever, uh, or or generous, you know, like 
when we experience gratitude for the generosity of others, then we, we can cultivate, it kind of gives rise to generosity. And when we see how, how much joy it can bring us to be generous and to share and to recognize that we don't have to kind of hoard things, we don't have to be afraid that we won't have enough, uh, then that generosity uh, kind of brings us into a sense of connection with other people, uh, with the life around us. And so, so there are causes and conditions for equanimity to arise. And one of them is insight. Um, insight is what arises through mindfulness and investigation. When we sit and we follow our breath, we feel the body, we notice that the breath arises and passes away. We notice that, you know, maybe a thought comes. Maybe it's a kind of a, a jealous thought, a thought that we wouldn't like it if it were kind of, you know, projected on a screen in front of everybody <laughs> that this was our thought that we thought. But, you know, thoughts come. And then when we recognize when we're mindful and we don't get caught up in that thought and we don't get caught up in the story and the story of, you know, it's not fair, it should be me, I want more, you know, and all of this, these jealous kind of storylines that cause so much suffering. And we, when, we, when we're mindful and we recognize, oh, there's jealousy, you know, and we kind of unhook ourselves from getting pull down that path to suffering. Uh, dukkha is the word for suffering, unhappiness, stress. Um, we begin to recognize, oh, these things come and go. A thought is not the truth of how things are. A thought is just a thought. If I don't get caught up in the thought, if I don't give a whole lot of credence to a thought and believe in it and make a whole narrative out of it, a thought can just come and go. And, and then there's the kind of the openness of not having that thought which was causing me pain. We can even Notice that with sensations. I mean, sensations, of course, come and go. Um, a sound. There's this funny clicking sound that's happening in the studio here, and it must be connected to the uh, heating system or something. It clicks on, clicks off. Uh, so sounds, yeah, they come, they go. Um, maybe there are sounds around you. Sound is a great way to discover the impermanence of sensory phenomena. Our breath, um, even sensations which feel like they're not changing, you know, like if you have a joint pain or, you know, like a knee that's, that's, um, a little bit stiff or something, and you think, oh, my knee is, it's always hurting. But it's, it's actually, the, those sensations are changing. And so when we realize impermanence, when we really investigate, mindfully investigate our experience, we, we begin to recognize that um, everything is changing. Everything's changing all the time. And that there's nothing that we can hold on to um, and make stable. Um, our friendships change because we're changing, they're changing, people move away. Um, and so with equanimity, it's not that we don't prefer things, but it's that we can be with our preferences in a way 
that's open-hearted, spacious, wise, brings perspective. So equanimity, um, sometimes equanimity has been uh, talked about like being, you know, a wise grandparent. You know, like, uh, of course, not everybody has had a a wise and loving, compassionate grandmother or grandfather. Uh, I didn't, you know. Um, but but there's this kind of archetype of the grandparent who, you know, they've they've seen their kids grow up, they've seen all the ups and downs of, you know, bringing up kids and uh, and how they go through um, struggles in their lives and they they meet those struggles, they learn from them, they can come out you know, stronger and uh, with confidence they can learn lessons. Um, and and so, so the, the grandparent, grandfather, grandmother can have a bit more perspective, you know, perhaps than the parent who, you know, can really be very invested in, you know, how you do in school or how you, you know, who you choose as a, partner or, you know, who your friends are or what interests you have. And, and so, uh, so the grandparent has, you know, a bit more spaciousness and perspective. And there's, there's also a way of understanding equanimity that we can be in the midst of all kinds of things that seem to be overwhelming. And we can be responding without being overwhelmed. So um, there's a, and, and the Pali word for equanimity, I can't remember what it is uh, right now, but it's translated as in the midst of, being in the midst of. And, um, and I like to think of that in, in, equ- in talking about equanimity because um, I was a single mom and, uh, and I you know, just have this, uh, this image of you know, being in the kitchen and needing to be making dinner and, you know, and having work responsibilities and... Um, and and sometimes I did feel overwhelmed, but uh, but that just that sense of finding a ground in recognizing, yeah, just one thing at a time, one thing at a time, and just uh, you know one step at a time. Um, so uh, so equanimity has that image as well as being in the midst of. Uh, life unfolding. And I think we can feel that way sometimes with uh, the many, many problems and dangers there are in the world. You know, that um, with, you know, the climate crisis that, you know, like the forests are burning and and species are going extinct. And... um, and, and also social problems. There's poverty, there's homelessness, there's racism, uh, there's anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and homophobia and transphobia and all of these things that are being expressed in society. And it's like, it can feel so overwhelming, like, what can I do? What can I do? How can I, how can I fix this? How can I live in this world? And um, and so, 
you know, we have compassion. We can have compassion. We can care about the suffering being caused, you know, by climate change. But in these, or and, not but, but and in the balance of, of these qualities of heart, compassion and love and, and joy in the happiness of others and equanimity, they, they balance each other. So, so equanimity, you know, says, I will do what I can do to respond. And equanimity also says, and there is also much to take joy in. There is also much that is beautiful and good in life. So, so this quality of joy which is one of the awakening factors, and it's also one of the boundless states of heart, you know, joy, compassion, uh, love, and equanimity. And so, so we can maybe get, you know, compassion for the, the suffering of others. Maybe we can get, if we, if, if we lose balance and it kind of, we get, caught up in all the bad things that are going on, the suffering that's happening. We can find the balance and equanimity and, and recognizing it doesn't help the world for me to crash and burn, for me to feel so despairing that, you know, I become frozen and paralyzed. I, I can do some things i can i can show compassion i can show up in my life i can take joy in what is beautiful and and so many people have said in terms of responding to the ills of the world the problems of the world we take care of what we love we take care of what we love we we respond with love because we feel connected in our lives. And so, so this, this connected and yet balanced quality of heart is, uh, is so important. And, and we cultivate equanimity moment by moment, you know, in, in being aware of our thoughts and being aware of sensations in the body and being aware how we respond to a family member or or an issue that comes up at work or in school or in you know in our friendships so just having that spaciousness to take a breath to recognize there's a strong preference coming up <laughs> Uh, I don't want this, or I really do want this. And to think, you know, well, what's, what's, how, how can I respond wisely and kindly in this moment to what is unfolding in my life right now? And so, so as we sit, we do that in very, very little ways, uh, micro practices um, in each moment. So let's, uh, let's move into our sitting. Um, and, and I invite you to take a moment to stand up, to, um, to stretch, uh, take a different posture if you'd like. For those of you at home, please feel welcome to just uh, 
comport yourself in whatever way in relation to the camera that you prefer. You feel free to turn it off or turn, turn away from it, um, whatever is comfortable for you. So let's um, begin by just bringing awareness to the body. The body sitting on the earth. So we might not think that we're sitting on the earth. We might think that the earth is like the, the ground. But we are sitting on Mother Earth. Um, wherever we are, whatever floor we're on, whatever is beneath us, Mother Earth is supporting us. And we can feel that in a very obvious way, just feeling the pressure of the body being supported. There's a cushion or a chair beneath us, and, um, and we're being supported. So we're always in relationship with the earth, whether we're standing or walking or we're lying down, even even when we're uh, jumping up in the air, (laughs) gravity is still calling us back. And as we begin our sitting, we might just bring a quality of honoring and respect to the people who have lived here for thousands of years before us, wherever we are, who have stewarded the earth the indigenous people who have um, lived with a sense of connection, interconnection, interdependence with the earth here in Montreal. uh, The Kanyankahaga people called this place Chichaga. It's a meeting place of many people, of of different waters and we can honor these ancestors who came before us. We can honor the ancestors uh, of our spiritual traditions, perhaps Buddhist, perhaps others that you may um, integrate into your spiritual practice, whether it be Christian or Jewish or Hindu or, um, or Muslim or indigenous or any other, honoring those teachings who have helped you to evolve into the person that you are. directly and indirectly. And let's feel the breath in the body, wherever you feel it. Maybe in the nostrils, or in the chest, or in the abdomen.
and letting be, the breath act as a kind of um, a drumbeat to call you home, call you back home to your body, the mind which may be scattered, restless, and the breath can call you back home, feeling the breath in the body, Just that simplicity of feeling a whole in-breath, beginning, middle, end. The place of turning into an out-breath, beginning, middle, end. And the pausing before the next in-breath. Those cycles of breath. Each breath is new. Each breath is ever so subtly different from the previous one. You can get curious about your breath. Does my breath feel relaxed or do I feel a kind of uh, tightness or contraction somewhere in my body around the breath? And if you notice that tightness, you can just be aware of that. You don't have to fix it or change it. You can just Bring a gentle presence to that, and maybe that will bring a bit more relaxation. Maybe not. Mindfulness does have that quality of of letting go, of not holding, not grasping. So sometimes when we not, when we find a place of con- contraction in the body, and we just bring that simple mindfulness. to the, that pra- place of contraction, tightness. It may, it may just release, it may loosen a little bit because we're, in a way, the holding on takes energy and we're We're just uh, releasing a little bit of that energy of holding on. As you settle into your practice and you're feeling the breath, maybe you're feeling the breath in a particular place, and I invite you to explore opening your awareness to a sense of the whole body. Just having an awareness of how the body feels. You might just 
bring a little bit of a kind of a body scan, feeling your body from the top of your head, just bringing an awareness through the face, the skull, the neck. And as you do that, just letting your breath be in the background, letting that drumbeat of the breathing in and breathing out be in the background and coming home to being in the body, being in the chest and the arms, shoulders, and the stomach and the lower back and the buttocks and the pelvis and the groin and the hip joints and the thighs the knees calves, the ankles, and the feet, heels and toes, an awareness that encompasses the whole body. And it doesn't have to be perfect. experiencing the whole body as a field, a field of sensations, vibrations, energy. It's all energy. Some may be pleasant, some may be unpleasant, some may be neutral. Finding a sense of home being at home, being at home in the body, abiding with calmness and kindness in this body. And this quality of balance, of stability in the body, whatever you experience, if you maybe experience it for a moment or, or it develops in your sitting, this is the orientation of equanimity, balance, stability of mind. There's a Tibetan saying describing this quality of meditation. Body like a mountain, breath like the wind, mind like the sky. The sky is not disturbed by whatever moves through it. 
the mountain remains stable even as the seasons change. The wind comes and goes on its own. We don't need to control it. So let's practice in silence.
as we come to the end of the practice, I invite you to bring into your awareness um, people that you care about, people that you know or maybe people that you don't know uh, who are perhaps um, undergoing, going through something challenging, difficult, or painful, uh, or, or people who are thriving and, uh, and you want their, you would love to uh, wish them that their happiness and, and uh, joy increase and um, develop in their lives. So, so just bringing those human and non, non-human beings into your heart and mind that you care about. And we can share the goodness of our practice with these beings. We can offer them blessings, you know, whatever moment of, of calm, of peace, of compassion, of insight has arisen in your own being uh, that you can bring this intention to share it, to share the benefit of that with others close to you and also in widening circles. May the, the goodness, the blessings of our practice and our lives serve and support the happiness, well-being, and liberation of all beings.